تا بانکی با اونها نداشتیم علی فتمی explain to us that uh, what's in that bill that Barack Obama signed that's making yeah. the currency drop before that let me just say one thing this election is a sham like all other elections they had 24 years of this regime Eight years of Mr. Rafsanjani, eight years of Khatami. These are totally blocked out. Today, this election is not going. Everybody has actually said they're, they're not. They're going to boycott the election. So government said, said talking about boycott is illegal. So please, let's not talk about elections. This is like Saddam Hussein's kind of elections. Now, the bill that was passed, uh, basically, I think it is not going to be operational. First of all, because it gives the president six months to consult with other countries to prepare the process. There is no precedent of a central bank being boycotted in economic history. The only organization- But it does slap sanctions on uh, lending institutions that uh, deal with the Iranian central bank. Yeah, that has been going on for a long time. But when you say boy- boycotting the central bank, sanctioning the central bank, only organization that can do that is the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, and they are not about to do that. So what will happen basically is <coughs> European banks or American banks are not going to deal directly with central bank. So everything will go to China, everything will go to Russia, with 10 to 15 percent uh, surcharge. It is not going to be what everybody thinks. I think this whole idea of sanctions have been misdirected. You put sanctions on a country where it has democratic government. So people with pressure will put pressure on the government. Government changes its attitude and its policies. This government has nothing to do with the Iranian people. So Iranian people have been suffering under sanctions for no good. Uh, Mayor Javandafar, do you agree that uh, these sanctions will have no effect? Um... I think it's difficult to say, but I think uh, I would, I would, as a whole, I would say that they could have an effect. I don't think any government around the world could ignore such restrictions. Uh, I think uh, that the new sanctions imposed by the United States against anybody who does business with the Iranian central bank, with regards to oil especially, is something that the government of Iran cannot ignore. Why? Because anybody who wants to buy or sell oil to Iran, uh, buy oil from Iran has to go through that bank, so now they won't be able to do that. Iran is expecting to earn somewhere between 100 to 110 billion dollars this year from oil. Uh, according to a recent report from the Associated Press, that provides up to 80 percent of government income. If that starts take, to take a hit, I, I, I think it's impossible for the Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei not to take notice from that. And I think, but there's another thing that we have to also watch watch out for. We have to see what the reaction of the people is. Um, you know, p- uh, people, uh, observers of Iran, including myself, have always been worried that if we go too hard, then we might push the people to the side of the government. Let's see. I mean, the, the real has been crashing for the last two days. I think it's, no, it's an open secret that it's because of the, the government's uh, handling of the nuclear file and the recent threat. Let's see if the people blame the West for it or blame President Ahmadinejad. Let's see if there's going to be a massive shift in support for President Ahmadinejad and Ayatollah Khamenei, or people are just going to stand on the sideline and basically blame the government for, for doing this. So are you saying that in effect these sanctions could be a good thing? Are you saying in effect these sanctions could be a good thing? Um, I think in terms of, uh, first of all, we don't want war. I think in, in terms of avoiding war and in terms of bringing the Iranian government back to the negotiation table with uh, a serious uh, compromise, I think they could be, and I emphasize the word could. Ruzbe Parsi. Well, first, I think these sanctions, insofar that they have an effect, is basically just to formalize a relationship that already exists. If a Chinese company has to choose between two markets, the U.S. market and the Iranian market, they will obviously choose the U.S. market. And they do that already just because of the deterrent effect of something like this could happen to them. So in that sense, you're just formalizing an unequal relationship within the world economic system, if you will. So in that sense, I I agree with you. And I also agree with you in that sanctions in general only work if you have some kind of democratic system, because that's the way you can build pressure from below. I would, however, not agree with you that elections in Iran in general just are a sham. I think there's a nuance to be had in the sense that, for instance, when Khatami was elected, that was a surprise to just about everyone. So they're not free and fair in the fullest sense, but they're not just totally predictable either. That has some. Now, regarding whether sanctions is a way of avoiding a war, I think that has often been an argument made, and I 
doubt that very, very much. Because you see, the point here is that this is not the first time we sanction Iran. We've been sanctioning them for a very long time. And every time they say, let's have another round of sanctions that will be even better than the last one. And at some point, the credibility of the idea of sanctions instead of war is going to run out. And then those who actually do want to war will be able to say, look, we tried everything you had. The only option left on this proverbial table is a war. Also remember, this is the worst time from an economic point of view for, the, for Europe, for the whole world, to go for sanctions. For something very funny happened the other day, I don't really know this or not. Europeans said, yes, yes, we are going to sanction Iranian oil. Italy said, yes, but first let us sell $2 billion more oil uh, to buy from Iran, and then we'll follow it. I mean, they all have to face their own electorate. They all want to get re-elected. And I think the first priority of politicians is to get re-elected. Therefore, th the problem basically is that if sanctions doesn't work, unfortunately, we have two alternatives. One is to live with an Iranian bomb, which some people are already trying to brainwash others that it can be done, so we have a second North Korea. Or the second one is a, a war or a, some sort of a, of aggression. I don't know. It could be a real bombardment. I don't know. Uh but let, 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 let's get back to what you were saying about the domestic uh, si situation a moment ago. And by the way, we should tell you that um, uh, we did invite uh, the Iranian embassy to join us, uh, the Iranian ambassador. No, they declined our invitation. But I want to get back to, to what you were saying and also to what Meir Javan Nafar was saying about what's going to happen next. And if you turn back the clock to 2009, we saw Tehran suddenly erupting amid anger over President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's re-election, those cries of fraud sparked an unprecedented outcry that caught lots of people by surprise. Um, I, I remember uh, Ruzbe Parsi, when we were having debates about this two years ago, basically every week we were called off, we were predicting what was going to happen next and we were getting it wrong. One of the things that's also happened in this context is we're a year into the Arab Spring, and there hasn't been an act to, to that so-called green revolution. Why is that? Well, I think we have to remember, of course, that dissent and uh, discontent in Iran has always been there. And it reached unprecedented levels with the elections in 2009. So it's just because they're not on the street doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But they have not been able to organize themselves and come up with a unifying message that brings everyone on board for one single uh, end goal, so to speak. And you can say paradoxically the reason for that is that there has been nuances within the system. That's why people don't agree on how far they want to go. I think brutal repression should not be forgotten. Of course. I mean, Iranians are not teaching the Syrians how to kill people. Basically, what they did is they went out, they have hired the hoodlums, they made, gave them uniform and weapons, and they shoot to kill. And basically, they cannot do this all along. I think it's during this election you are going to see demonstrations. And the fight is actually between Ahmadinejad and Khamenei. Everybody else is staying out of this whole election game. Uh, Mohammed Sahimi, in 2009, uh, it was uh, the uh, Green Revolution in Iran that wrote the book, really, on a social network-fueled uh, uprising. Um, are you, uh, I know that you follow this closely. You monitor uh, what goes on in Iran closely. Are you getting signs that uh, something is happening ahead of those legislative elections in March? In terms of the green movement, no. Aside from the fact that um, the reforms and other groups that uh, strive for democracy have basically boycotted the Madras election, I don't see anything at the societal level. To, to progress the sham election that is coming up. But let me just point out one thing that Dr. Fox is not paying attention to. The elections of Madras are sham elections. There is no question about it. There are show elections. But it's not significant. That, uh, in that election, the two factions within the government, the factions led by Ahmadine, the faction led by Ayatollah Khamenei, are going at each other's throat. So in the long run, weakening of both factions within the government, all right, Mohammed Sahimi, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're breaking up once again. Uh, apologies uh, for, the te for, for the technical issues. Um, come in here for a second, please? Meyer, go ahead. Um, in terms of the, the sanctions, just, just a quick point, and also about the elections, two quick points. With regards to sanctions working, the West has an ally in terms of making sure that the sanctions 
hurt the Iranian regime, especially as much as pos possible, and that allies the concept of Ahmadinejadonomics. Basically, the economic concepts of President Ahmadinejad's politics have been so disastrous that I don't think the regime can use the impact of the sanctions to discredit the position of the West, because President Ahmadinejad himself has been such a walking disaster for Iran's economy. And in terms of the elections, Francois, if you're looking for a threat, let's listen to what the uh, Minister of Intelligence, Mr. Haydar Muslehi, said in Iran. The threats he mentioned were pro-American reformists, which majority of the leadership is now uh, in, you know, in prison or, or at home uh, under, under guard. House arrest. Or the supporters of President Ahmadinejad. He's basically sitting, you know, President Ahmadinejad is basically on the... Uh, uh, President Ahmadinejad is seen as a threat by the Minister of Intelligence, who had a uh, falling out with him. And when the Minister of Intelligence in Iran warns about the people, the deviants, as they call them, the supporters of Ahmadinejad being a threat, you can see where the concerns of the regime is now. It's within, it's not Mr. Karubi or Musavi who are under house arrest, it's people who are supporting Ahmadinejad and they're not going to sit down and take the disqualifications which could be coming their way because it's very possible that the Guardian Council could disqualify them, especially President Ahmadinejad's sister Parvin who, is, who said she wants to run. Can you imagine if she's disqualified? So the threats within for the next elections, I think, is not so much from the reformist camp. I think the government has basically locked them away, and there is, as Roosevelt said, there's a crisis in leadership. But there is President Ahmadinejad himself. He is considered as a threat for the upcoming Majlis elections. And we know that rivalry between uh, Ayatollah Khamenei and uh, President Ahmadinejad has gone very public. Um, here's what Yasmin Alem in the Dubai-based news uh, newspaper The National uh, writes. While the president's camp pulls the strings of the Ministry of Interior, which is in charge of conducting the elections, the Supreme Leaders Group controls the omnipotent Guardian Council that vets candidates and certifies the election results. So we have the rivalry here between the president and the uh, supreme leader, and all those dissidents who are going to boycott. What's going to happen in March? That's a very good question. But, I mean, in a sense, what you can say is that you're getting to a point of diminishing returns every time they are forcing someone out of the circle of being inside the elite. So what has happened since 2009 is that the conservatives have found out that the only thing they agree on, besides being conservative in general, is that they don't like the reformists. On everything else, they disagree. So we are at the point where the Speaker of Parliament is trying to do the bidding of the Supreme Leader vis-à-vis -vis the President, who then has his own allies within Parliament. And so everyone is, is trying to position themselves, not because these elections in themselves necessarily will change much, but they will be a harbinger of what is to come with the next presidential elections, and, which will be in 2013. And if it's a big boycott? Well, they will, you know... The Islamic Republic has had uh, voter turnout from 50 percent upwards, and I think they would be happy with 50 percent. The question is, where is that 50 percent going to go? Okay, we'll have to leave it there. I want to thank you, uh, Ruz Bey. Very, very briefly, one word, because we're, we're out of time. Can I make time. one point? Sure. For, these uh, majlis elections are very important and cannot be ignored because Ayatollah Khamenei has said that it is possible that the position of the president could be removed altogether and that the majlis would, would choose a prime minister. So the next majlis elections are actually crucial for the regime and cannot be ignored. All right.